Chers et chers collègues, chères étudiantes, chers étudiants, mesdames et messieurs, chers et chers amis, je m'adresse à vous en, en français and I will address you, uh, dear Trina, in English immediately after. Après plusieurs années d'interruption dans la tradition des cérémonies de remise du titre de docteur honoris causa de l'Université bordeaux Montaigne, c'est un honneur et un plaisir de vous accueillir dans l'amphi 700 de l'Université bordeaux Montaigne pour remettre à Madame Trina Robbins l'une des plus prestigieuses distinctions décernées par les universités françaises pour honorer des personnalités en raison de services éminents rendus aux sciences, aux lettres ou aux arts, à la France ou à l'université. Trina Robbins vient compléter une liste illustre qui comprend, entre autres, un prix Nobel de la paix, un président de la République du Sénégal, un président de la République portugaise, de nombreux écrivains et intellectuels. Elle rejoint aussi Sally Toubash, universitaire états-unienne, Kaija Sariao, musicienne et compositrice finlandaise, Judith Butler, philosophe états-unienne, Vigdis Finbagadotir, présidente de la République d'Islande, qui sont, je le crains, les seules femmes à avoir reçu cette distinction ces dernières années à l'Université bordeaux Montaigne. Il faut le reconnaître, un certain rééquilibrage en termes de parité est souhaitable dans la communauté des docteurs honoris causa de l'Université bordeaux Montaigne. Aujourd'hui, nous honorons certes une autrice, une historienne de la, bande dessinée, de la bande dessinée, mais nous honorons aussi, avec beaucoup de fierté, une militante féministe, une militante qui s'est battue pour faire progresser la reconnaissance des femmes dans la bande dessinée, qui a créé, entre autres, Women's Comics, une anthologie d'autrices de bande dessinée, et a été la première femme à dessiner Wonder Woman en 1986, si je ne me trompe pas. Dans l'actualité des États-Unis, un pays où les droits des femmes sont battus en brèche depuis plusieurs années, il est d'autant plus important d'honorer Trina Robbins. Outre cette dimension de la personnalité et de la carrière de notre invité, Trina Robbins représente également plusieurs sujets qui deviennent ou sont devenus des disciplines scientifiques qui nous occupent beaucoup à l'Université bordeaux Montaigne. En premier lieu, bien sûr, la bande dessinée, une expression artistique que nous travaillons beaucoup dans cette université. De nombreuses chercheuses et de nombreux chercheurs de bordeaux Montaigne s'intéressent à la bande dessinée sous toutes ses formes, dans plusieurs langues. Le master illustration, rare voire unique dans le paysage universitaire français, forme les étudiants à la pratique mais également à la recherche critique sur la bande dessinée. Et nos bibliothèques sont dotées d'une des plus grandes collections, sinon la plus grande collection de comics et bandes dessinées du pays. Tuna Robbins est aussi une figure de la contre-culture états-unienne. Elle a traversé les années 60 et 70 qui ont produit tant de mouvements sociaux et œuvres artistiques qui sont autant d'objets d'études pour nombre de chercheuses et chercheurs de bordeaux Montaigne. Enfin, j'ai lu dans l'exposition que nous donnons en l'honneur de Trina Robbins dans le hall du bâtiment de la présidence que dans les années 50 et 60, elle était une membre active de la Science Fiction Fandom, ce qui intéressera celles et ceux de nos collègues et étudiants qui s'adonnent aux Fan Studies un champ en progression. En bref, Trina est ici chez elle, dans une université que d'aucuns triste cire appelle wokiste, mais que je préfère appeler curieuse, ouverte au monde et attentive aux relations interculturelles et aux évolutions sociales et sociétales. Je vous remercie de votre présence à toutes et à tous. Et je remercie bien sûr très chaleureusement Trina Robbins de nous honorer de sa présence. Elle mérite amplement l'hommage que vont maintenant, après quelques mois en anglais, lui rendre euh, Jean-Paul Gabillet, professeur de civilisation américaine et spécialiste de la bande dessinée et des comics, 
et Nathalie Jaec, professeure de littérature britannique et vice-présidente à la recherche de l'Université bordeaux Montaigne. Dear Trina Robbins, after an interruption of several years in the tradition of bordeaux Montaigne University's Doctor Honoris Causa ceremonies, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to the Amphi 700, that's untranslatable, of bordeaux Montaigne University to present you with one of the most prestigious distinctions awarded by French universities, to honor personalities for eminent services rendered to the sciences, letters or arts, to France or to the university. You join an illustrious list that includes, among others, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, a president of the Republic of Senegal, a president of the Portuguese Republic, and numerous writers and intellectuals. You also join Sally Tubash, a University of California professor, Kaija Sariaho, the Finnish musician and composer, Judith Butler, American philosopher, Vigdis Finbagadotter, President of the Republic of Iceland, who are, I'm afraid, the only women to have received this distinction in recent decades before you today. Admittedly, bordeaux Montaigne University has some catching up to do in presenting this title to more illustrious women in the coming years. If only for this reason, thank you very much for being here tonight. Today we are honoring, honoring an author, a comic book historian, rather a historian, as you call yourself in an interview I watched. But we are also proud to honor a feminist activist one who fought to improve the recognition of women in comics, who created, among other things, Women's Comics, an anthology of female comic book authors, and who was the first woman to draw Wonder Woman in 1986, in a time when women's rights in the United States are under serious attack. It is all the more significant to honor the American feminist activist in you. In addition to this dimension of your personality and career, Trina Robbins, you also represent several subjects that have become or are becoming scientific disciplines that keep us very busy at bordeaux Montaigne University. First and foremost, of course, is comics, an artistic expression that many of our researchers and students work on with great passion. Many bordeaux Montaigne University researchers are interested in comics in several languages, throughout its history or its practices. The Illustration Master's Programme, which is rare, if not unique, in the French university landscape, trains students in the practice and critical research of, of comics. And our university libraries uh, possess one of the largest collection of comics in France. You are also an important figure in the American counterculture, having lived through the 60s and 70s, which produced so many social movements and artistic works that have become objects of study for many researchers at bordeaux Montaigne University. Finally, I read today in the exhibition dedicated to you just outside this venue, that in the 50s and 60s, you were an active member of science fiction fandom, which will be of interest to those of our colleagues and students involved in fan studies, a growing field of research. In short, dear Trina, you must consider yourself at home at bordeaux Montaigne University, a university that some conservative detractors easily accuse of being woke. When in fact, we are curious, open to social and societal changes and attentive to intercultural relationships. Thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. You wholly deserve the tribute you will now receive from Jean-Paul Gabillet, Professor of American Civilization and a Comics Specialist, and Nathalie Jaec, Professor of British Literature and Vice President of Research at bordeaux Montaigne University. Thank you. Jean-Paul, the mic is yours.
suivant la tradition instaurée par notre président, je vais enlever le couvre-chef. Mon éloge va être prononcé en anglais, mais il a été mis à disposition du public, tout comme celui de Nathalie Jaec, tout à l'heure en en VO et en VF. Donc, euh, pensons que tout le monde pourra suivre sans problème euh, cet éloge. Donc, nous avons fait le choix de le présenter euh, en anglais directement. Et bon, et non, et non pas de présenter deux éloges, l'un en français et l'un en anglais, parce que là, la cérémonie aurait duré très, très, très longtemps. Euh, Monsieur le Président, euh, Madame la vice-présidente de la recherche, euh, chers collègues, chers étudiantes, chers étudiants, euh, chère Trina, dear Trina, this institution awarded its first honorary doctorate to the Spanish writer and historian Rafael Altamira, I'm sorry for the Spanish pronunciation, which is probably incorrect, in 1923. Today, one century later, it is a great pleasure and a great honor for the Université Bordeaux Montaigne to confer upon you a doctorate commending your contributions to the various fields in which you have left a mark. At the University of Cambridge, it is customary to deliver speeches in Latin to extol the achievements of honorary doctors. Hence, no, unfortunately or fortunately, we are not uh, in Cambridge, and uh, this speech will be given in 21st century English. Nonetheless, I will take the liberty of making a couple of asides in Latin to stress the solemnity of this occasion and every so often use the term honoris causa to refer to the reason why we are all gathered here today. I am very happy to have been assigned the task of being one of the orators justifying what makes you worthy of this title. First, I wish to dedicate this short speech to two women of your generation with whom you share many common points. The first one is my doctoral supervisor, the late Professor Ginette Castro. In the 1980s, she was one of the first scholars in France to specialize in the history of American women and American feminism. She was also a generous, open-minded academic who readily agreed to supervise a master's thesis about a then admittedly goofy topic, uh, comics and ideology in the United States, submitted by yours truly one autumn day in 1988. Ginette Castro, knew little about comics, but she was delighted to learn more about this medium, especially after I told her that in the early 1970s, some American women cartoonists involved in the counterculture had produced feminist comics. The second woman to which, uh, which I refer to now is the great Canadian author Margaret Atwood. Uh, like you, she has been a lifelong, unabashed fan of comic books, and her literary output of the last six decades has included poetry, essays, fiction, non-fiction, and graphic novels. Women writing about women, women receptive to the comic strip medium, I see quite a few striking analogies between Jeanette Castro, Margaret Atwood, and Trina Robbins. When this university's powers that be 
so two of whom are sitting next to you, uh, started thinking about who their next choice for an honoris causa degree would be, a number of names were suggested. But they soon became curiouser and curiouser about someone whose biography and career were at first encapsulated in the term the funny book lady, or in more fancy academic English, the comic art woman. Trina Robbins, uh, both Trina Robbins and Margaret Atwood are indeed funny book ladies of sorts, but your multifaceted career has definitely made of you America's premier woman of comic art. You were born, <coughs> excuse me, you were born in Queens, grew up in Brooklyn, in a surprisingly non-dysfunctional family, as you said in your uh, autobiography. Uh, you recall that your parents, both immigrants from Belarus, were progressive, liberal Jews of the lower middle class. But even though they did not make much money, you and your elder sister Harriet were raised in a positive and happy environment. Your life story is the one of a short-sighted and shy little girl with a passion for reading in post-war America. And the little girl, over seven decades, went on to become a woman of significance in two distinct fields that she brought together, feminism and comics. One can safely argue <coughs> that you have been a woman of many careers. After you left your parents' home in the very late 50s, you were briefly a model in the girly mag business, then a clothes designer in early 1960s Los Angeles. You were a clothes designer, again, with your own Greenwich Village boutique, as well as an occasional cartoonist in New York City for the East Village Other from 1966 to 1969, then an underground comics artist as of the 1970s, and a writer of comics and comics color in the last 40 years. Women, design, and writing are the three threads that define your career. You dressed women, you drew women, you wrote about women, you engaged in scholarly research about women. You designed clothes, cartoons, comics, wrote comics, and wrote on comics about women, by women, for women. Would you, by any chance, be what some people call a feminist? <clears throat> Woe is me, another one of those accursed F words. Here I am now having to walk on eggshells. <clears throat> you, of all people, will reply that, of course, you are and have been a feminist and quite a vocal one since the late 1960s. But you have also been called a controversial feminist by persons who noticed what they regarded as strange paradoxes in your career. In 1970, you released It Ain't Me Babe, uh, that you called, I quote you, the very, very, very first all-woman comic book. That's what you told uh, an audience at the San Francisco Public Library a few years ago. But you were also, although by chance, the original designer of the ultra-sexy outfit worn by Vampirella, one of the most iconic American cheesecake-slash-bad-girl comic book characters of the last half-century. For a 1972 underground one-shot, which was titled Turned on Cuties, you drew an erotic rendition of the famous superhero Wonder Woman. Fifteen years later, you drew a classic retelling of her origin for DC Comics, 
And 26 years after that, you featured the same character in Wonder Woman, the once and future story, a short novel about a short graphic novel about battered women and abusive relationships illustrated by Colin Doran and Butch Guys. In the late 60s and early 70s, you produced comics that featured sex and pornography, but in a women-focused perspective, radically different to the over-the-top lewdness of the period's male underground comic artists. And in the last couple of decades, you've written a large number of books about famous and not so famous women for younger and older readers. In the good old days of drugs, free love, and rock and roll, you had affairs with the numbers of celebrities. That's what you say in your autobiography. <laughs> Including the Doors leader, Jim Morrison. And, uh, well, according to what you say, he was not the most pleasant person uh, with whom to be in a relationship. Uh, and today, you have become one of the well-known mouthpieces of women's empowerment in America. These examples may give the impression that you are a woman of many paradoxes. I rather believe they show that you are simply a free woman. It should not be a surprise to anyone to realize or simply remember that there are many ways of being a feminist and being, femi being committed to feminist causes may come in many shades, especially as time and history move on. Today, we praise you for your achievements as a designer, an artist, an activist, but also as a writer and scholar. After you began a career carving out a niche for women comic creators, a niche that became increasingly expansive, <clears throat> you proceeded to become the chronicler of the place, role, and function of women in American comics history. Women and the Comics, the project that you co-authored in 1985 with Cat Ironwood, was largely a response to Maurice Horn's 1977 book, Women in the Comics, which was a well-illustrated but overly male gaze biased volume. It was the first step in your second, well, second or third or fourth one loses count, yeah, well, your next career, <laughs> uh, the one that brought you to become a scholar and her historian of American comics. The history of the medium since the mid-20th century had been written exclusively by men whose tastes and preferences had brought them to pay little attention to or even to frequently ignore the agency of women in the comics industry. They would typically acknowledge a few noticeable women, uh, female characters, but by and large, they also gave short shrift to both women creators and female readers who found themselves relegated to the status of second rate, third rate, or even uh, non-existent agents in the cultural experience of comics. Over more than a dozen books published between 1985 and 2023, you have set the record straight. You have mapped out the experience of womanhood in American comics since the late 19th century. You've broken with your predecessor's male-oriented bibliographic tradition, and rediscovered, sometimes even unearthed, female creators who had been neglected or sometimes had to conceal their gender identity to work in the comics industry. <clears throat> so here, là, je vais dire quelque chose sur lequel Trina m'a dit hier que j'avais tort. 
Mais ce n'est pas grave, je garde le texte comme il est. So I'm going to say something about which you told me yesterday that I, I was wrong, but I'm keeping the text as it is. <laughs> for, inter, for instance, in the 1940s, June Mills was a cartoonist who had to use the enigmatic pseudonym Torpe Mills to get her comic strip Miss Fury published by the Bell Syndicate. Why? Well, editors and publishers uh, expected women creators to hide behind male pen names because they took it for granted that boys who they thought accounted for the majority of their readership would shirk comics reportedly authored by women. Uh, in the mid 20th century, in the neo-Victorian America, the so-called separate spheres ideology held that society should be structured along a clear line of divide between men and women. This mindset permeated every aspect of the country's popular cultural production. Men produced comics for boys, while women, at least the few working in the industry, were expected to write comics for girls. The very idea of boys knowingly reading comics produced by ladies was sacrilegious, and the promise of breeding a generation of sexually deviant juvenile delinquents. Over to Cambridge. Horesco reference. It's Latin. It means one cringes just thinking about it. Uh, as for girls reading comics for boys, publishers assumed that there were so few of them, of girls, that they might as well have not existed. But they were wrong. There was Trina Perlson, there was Margaret Atwood, and there were several hundred thousand, even millions of girls and women who relished comic books filled with adventure, mayhem, uh, uh, horror, costume heroes, but they also enjoyed the humor of Archie Comics, 70 years before it became the Netflix series Riverdale. And women and girls loved just as much the sundry girls' comics that inundated the racks of news dealers. Ironically, ironically, many girls' comics were actually scripted and drawn by men, but that was not an issue for publishers. <clears throat> for instance, a few people remember that after the Second World War, Atlas, the company that would later became, uh, become Marvel Comics, gradually ceased publishing superhero stories and started putting out titles for girl readers. And so, 15 years before creating Spider-Man, sweep, sweep, <laughs> The Incredible Hulk, or Iron Man. <laughs> Stanley churned out hundreds of romance and humor stories that featured Nelly the nurse, Millie the model, Patsy and Hedy, and so many others. Trina Robbins has taught us that publishers would go out of their way to protect the era's best kept secret. The era's best kept secret was not the blueprints of the nuclear bomb, but it was the fact that most comic books were actually read by individuals of both sexes, regardless of the assigned gender of a given title's implicit readership. And yet, there was a specifically female experience of comics reading. Before the internet, before television, comic books and even some newspaper comic strips like a Milton Keneff's theory and the Pirates, for example, were spaces of interactivity between readers and their favorite characters. The letters sent to magazines are valuable testimonies about how readers responded to the cultural contents of periodicals, but they have to be handled with precaution because quite a few letters were penned by the editors themselves. But the pages of comic books were a hospitable 
and a quasi-natural habitat for one of the oldest and most affordable playthings, paper dolls. Before the blonde bimbo Barbie and a brain-dead boyfriend Ken, excuse my French, uh, before they became a global rage among little girls in the 1960s, paper dolls were a staple in very many comics and magazines for girls, who thus took part directly in the creation of their entertainment. The greatest thrill for a reader was to see the design she had submitted be redrawn by a cartoonist and appear in the pages of a favorite magazine. Beyond the interaction between reader and comic book, paper dolls exemplified an incredibly vast range of colorful and imaginative fashion designs, but also vocational aspirations into which girls could project themselves freely, regardless of social pressures to become wives, mothers, and homemakers. Let's face it, many boys also enjoyed paper dolls. Long before gender fluidity became an accepted notion in defining one's identity. Paper dolls have been one of Trina Robbins' main uh, objects of fascination uh, as far back as her underground comics career because of the way in which they merged all her primary interests, fashion design, cartooning, and gender identity. Your latest book, Trina, is titled Dauntless Dames, High Heeled Heroes of the Comic Strip. So an anthology you co-edited with Peter Maresca about smart, tough, independent female protagonists of comics between the late 30s and early 50s. It was released last month. The next one won't back down. Uh, an anthology in support of Planned Parenthood will come out in a couple of weeks. You are now 85 years young and still as active and committed as you were six decades ago. You have been and continue to be a major actress and player in the defense of women's rights and the legitimization of the comics medium. You have opened up an entire horizon of research that had remained in a blind spot until the 1980s. Dear Trina Robbins, everyone at the Université Bordeaux Montaigne, everyone present in this lecture hall, tonight salute you for your creative, artistic, scholarly achievements, as well as the activist commitment of a career placed under the aegis of comics and women. This is the reason why this honoris causa doctorate is conferred upon you summa cum laude, as they say in Cambridge. Thank you for your attention. Et je donne maintenant la parole à notre vice-présidente pour la recherche, Nathalie Jaec, qui également a enlevé le chapeau. Ben oui, je ne voulais pas me faire remarquer puisque vous l'aviez tous les deux enlevé. Dear colleagues, dear students and dear friends, my dear Trina Robbins, it is a great honor for Bordeaux Montaigne University and a thrilling pleasure for me to welcome you here and to pronounce the second part of the speech to award you with an honorary doctorate. To Sherlock Holmes, Irene Adler was always the woman. Well, today I am proud to be the woman we thought was needed and was entitled to celebrate as a woman and as vice president for research your lifelong achievements. 
Let us be quite explicit. We wanted to award this distinction to a woman. We wanted our universities and social sciences university to make the statement of celebrating a prominent female artist and writer, quite simply, as our president said, because it is high time we caught up. Out of 27 honorary degrees that were awarded in our university in 100 years, you are, as the president said, only the fifth woman. As Adrian Rich put it in The Fact of a Doorframe, a woman in the shape of a monster, a monster in the shape of a woman, the skies are full of them. Indeed, the skies are full of all these female artists, writers, intellectuals, whose prominent work went unregistered by history, who were deemed negligible anomalies, who were literally unauthorized. So we wanted to elect a woman whose work would be groundbreaking, whose influence on a discipline would be an immense, undisputable landmark. We also ideally wanted that remarkable artist to have shifted the lines as regards the situation of women. When Jean-Paul Gabillier, that you have had the pleasure of listening to, who is a specialist in American comics, a colleague, and my dear friend, I mention friendship here, Trina, because I know that it is no detail to you. Your spirited and daring autobiography, Last Girl Standing, that you published in 2017, makes it clear how much you value friendship. How you celebrate its fun, and your book is a very cheerful parade of mini-skirted, long-bearded, often on drugs friends. But also, not only its fun, but also its political function. And so when um, my friend, Jean-Paul, suggested you, Trina Robbins, we all knew that we had struck gold. We knew that you were the one for us. Indeed, you are dashingly all three things. A remarkable artist, a reference writer on female cartoonists, and a feminist pioneer. Plus, you are, in fact, an icon. You are legend material, as a few quotes from the press amply prove. You are referred to as, I quote, Brooklyn-born underground comic artist turned legend. You are the controversial feminist who revolutionized comic books. A reader in an early 1959 issue of Famous Monsters gratified you, sorry, gratified you with a compliment that I cannot but quote in front of a French audience. You are America's answer to Brigitte Bardot. <laughs> <laughs> you are I must say I discovered it when preparing this speech. You are, I was in awe when I realized it, you are the iconic Trina in, Lady, uh, in, sorry, in Johnny Mitchell's song, Ladies of the Canyon. Yeah, that's the first word of the song. And that is pretty cool. You are first, dear Trina Robbins, an illustrious artist. And your passion with comics, as Jean-Paul developed, was born in childhood, your parents allowing you to read this reputedly bad genre. From a very early age, you read all the comics you could lay your hands upon that featured girls or women on the covers, as well as Will Eisner's The Spirit Section of Sunday Newspapers, and all the Golden Age comics with a special mention to Matt Baker, who was then the only black cartoonist. You devoured the adventures of Patsy Walker, Millie the Model, Katie Keene's, Katie Keene, superheroines like Wonder Woman, but also regular girls like Mary Marvel. And the coexistence between heroines and normal girls later came to characterize your own work the adventures of little normal Davy Graham, counterpointing those of outstanding Panthea. Now, obviously, your work is characterized by the empowerment of women. Your heroines are strong, fighting women, 
like your three most famous icons, your own revisitation of Rosie the Riveter, the best worker in the factory in wartime, fatal Lulu Bell with a line that I love, the kind of smarty who breaks up every party, don't bring Lulu. And of course, your own jungle heroine, Panthea. Your women have jobs that were typically exercised by men, Speed Queen, the female aviator and yellow dog, and female detectives, for example, like Scarlet Pilgrim or Sally Starr. You also, as Jean-Paul said, designed the costume of Vampirella. You were the first woman to draw Wonder Woman. And you also drew a, a, a couple of Barbie adventures. Let's say you were a sort of proto Greta Gerwig, betting on Barbie as an efficient surface to pass on feminist messages. But there is something particularly striking in your strips. Such empowerment of women was well, striking to me as I read them. Such empowerment of women is often obtained through a joyful glorification of what I would like to call, um, to call minor modes, through the decision to explore and highlight the active and creative power of minority. In your comics, dear Trina Robbins, what is deemed minor, what is minorized, is inverted and turned into a desirable source of empowerment be there minor social positions, like a female worker in a factory, minor gender identities, a lesbian, minor age, little girls or teenagers, minor color, with Fox, your black heroine, minor activities, suing, minor political choices, with your parody, your excellent parody of flower children with Susie Slum Goddess. These positions, as you um, draw them, are not derogatory anymore. They are not seen as places of relegation or prejudice, certainly not as second best in a hierarchical structure. Minority, and singularly womanhood, becomes a proud statement, a space you decide to claim as your own and actively occupy as an opportunity to come up with political, social, and aesthetic creative alternatives. It is not so much that what has been minimized by patriarchy strikes back. It is rather reassessed and reclaimed as the very site of empowerment, but also as a way to opt out of hierarchies and to praise with your female friends other, mo other modes of organization more collective, more horizontal. To parody one of your titles, you enacted the passage from girls to girls. From the minimization of little girls deemed not to read comics and the minimization of women to roaring, prosperous, empowered girl, well, girls. Teams Reclaim agency over adults, zines over institutional papers, and what you draw and celebrate are also the little things that form part of female culture and that were excluded from representation. And it did make me think, I had to quote her, it did make me think of Jane Austen's artistic commitment. She wanted to compose, I quote, on a little bit two inches wide of ivory, defining herself as a practitioner of the small scale. And I think it's quite akin to what you do. Two examples of your minor modes. First, your parodic mini-comic Sally Star Hollywood Girl Sleuth in 1972, in which you address all the dominant modes of Hollywood, the star system, the detective movies, and you fold them into a highly creative and parodic mini form. Parody between being, sorry, both an understatement, paying a tribute to other references, and an overstatement with you, a way to displace and reinterpret dominant mode, modes of representation. Second example your wonderful, wonderful paper dolls. 
I cut a few. I had good fun. So these are taken from Trina's books. They do work very, very well. They are good fun. That's another one. So, your own wonderful paper dolls. You drew and inserted in comics lots of paper dolls for little girls to cut out and dress in different costumes, a definite marker of trivialized feminine culture and little girls' tastes and pleasures and also a tribute to pin-up Katie Keene, a famous Archie Comics character who would constantly put on new clothes and for whom little girls could send... So oh, sorry. For whom little girls could send pictures of outfits and the best fashions were printed with a quote to the little girl who drew it. This points to yet another aspect of this minor mode you opted for. My dear Trina Robbins, you were always many things at the same time, and you never did hierarchize between lesser activities and presumably nobler ones. You were all at once a clothes designer, an underground comics author, a model, sometimes in the nude, a journalist in several countercultural papers. You did front pages. You were a book writer. You did illustrations. You were an editor. You were an arty, full-on hippie. You were a mother. You were a researcher. You were a publisher. You were first a very hype designer of glorious clothes in a cult boutique with a marginal name, Broccoli, with an offbeat, so chic address. 56 East 4th Street in Manhattan. And basically everyone that was making a name for themselves in the musical a bohemian hippie and rock scene had to have a Trina dress, miniskirts being your own favorite. And of course, you did protocomic drawings at a time when they did not have a name yet, starting with the mythical Evo, the first underground paper in the village. Your first trips were Art Nouveau ads for your boutique, and as you drew, you also made clothes for the editor, Walter Bauert, singularly his very emblematic American flag jacket that you made for him. You moved to San Francisco in 1969, following along with the mass migration of Manhattan cartoonists. That was when underground, underground comic books actually became a thing, as you mentioned yesterday, the wonderful master class for the uh, master, uh, the, for the master d'illustration. So that was when underground comic books became a thing in the, wait of, in the wake of Robert Crumb's trailblazing Zap Comics 1. The San Francisco underground comic scene was very much, as you said, at the time, a real kind of clique, like a man's club, like almost drinking buddies. And the guys drew comics, and if you were a woman, you were just someone's old lady. Crumb was the dominant charismatic figure there. And he said the tone of drawing what you thought were increasingly violent male sexist fantasies debasing women. Because of that, because you were rejected, not let in, by that underground male scene, two groundbreaking things happened as a consequence of that misogynist domination of the genre. Creative sorority first happened as you got involved in a collective of women that would create and publish their own comics. The other thing that happened was that you became a writer on a mission, a her-storian, when you began what was to become the work of a lifetime, excavating and historicizing the work of female cartoonists that had been totally ignored by male historians and anthologists, and proving very wrong the misconception that women had never read or written comics. The underground all-women scene was just being born in 1969. You joined the staff of the first woman's liberation paper on the West Coast 
It Ain't Me Baby, and you published the very first all-woman comic anthology ever, made and edited by women, what uh, comics historian Hilary Shute called a terrain-shifting move. It was followed with the 1971 anthology All Girl Thrills, and by your first solo comic book, Girl Fight One. Two years later, in 1972, you were one of the founders of the now cult, longest running and quite democratic comic series, once more created and edited by women only, women's comics, each issue being edited in turn by a different contributor. You focused there on twice minorized women, lesbians, with the first lesbian comic book character outside of pornography called Sandy Comes Out, mothers also trying to have a career in the collective work Mama Dramas, women writing erotic comics and inverting, inverting the male gaze in wet satin. In your autobiography, Last Girl Standing, you explain how despite difficulties, misunderstandings and rivalries, these comics were formal laboratories where women were given a chance to draw, to practice their art and to improve, and you and your comrades definitely made a difference and secured an influential position for yourselves in the underground comics. But being acknowledged was not enough for you. Ever since the 1990s, you have worked to widen the scope to research and credit your predecessors. Those pioneering invisibilized cartoonists, female cartoonists, as you said, you have never wanted to be the only woman in the room. It started with setting the record straight in response to Maurice Horn's Women in the Comics, which you thought was outrageous because instead of focusing on women who actually drew comics, he anthologized female sexy characters and male fantasies. You thus wanted to write a history of women who had worked in comics, and with Kite Iron Road, you published the greatly acclaimed Women and the Comics in 1985, the first of a kind and the prototype of a series of anthologies in which you would research and print and reprint the work of, for example, Ethel Hayes, Edwina Dom, Grace Drayton, Dale Messick, Nell Brinkley. A century of women cartoonists from girls to girls. A history of comics for girls and women, proving once and for all that girls had read comics well and truly. Pretty in Ink in 2013, Dauntless Dames in 2023, and Because You Do Not Relent, won't back down to be published later this September, fighting for the endangered right of abortion through your own favorite mode of intervention for nearly 40 years, a comics anthology. Allowing for the resurfacing of minorized art, sorry, allowing for the resurfacing of minorized artists is currently a major contemporary concern for historians, as it has become clear that history is a partial narrative and that it is necessary to reassess contexts of creation by crediting the works of minorities. But, dear Trina Robbins, you were definitely a precursor in that discourse and the pioneer in implementing it 40 years ago. On top of being an outstanding artist, you have been a driving force who definitely shifted the lines of your art. You predominantly contributed to shape the development of comic books and the way we perceive the place and the influence of women in them. You not so much forced the doors open as you created a whole new empowering collective space of publication for women and reconfigured the gendered scene of comics from the 1970s onwards. For all these reasons, the Université Bordeaux Montaigne and everyone here tonight is immensely honored, proud and pleased to award you with this Doctora Honoris Causa, and we thank you ever so much.
thank you. <laughs> did I really do all those things you mentioned? I guess I did. Um, 23 years ago, I thought I would never win an award because in America, all the comics awards went to white male artists who drew superheroes. Um, it all changed, actually it all changed in 2013. Um, in 2013, I was elected into the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame, which in the United States is a very major, if you're in comics, is a very major thing to, to belong to. It's a Hall of Fame, and it's named after an artist and a writer who I am a big fan of, Will Eisner. He did great women. Um, that year, that year at the San Diego Comic Convention, which is about the equivalent, I guess it's the American equivalent of uh, Angoulême. It's the biggest comic convention. That year that I was elected into the Hall of Fame, every award was given to a woman. Not one superhero artist won an award that year. And that's when everything changed. And now there are so many women in the United States drawing comics, it's, it's beyond my wildest dreams. I never thought that there would be that many women drawing comics. So many that I don't know them all. I can't remember their names. So things have changed. And um, I'm very happy that they've changed. I hope they've changed here too. And thank you again very much. Okay, dear Trina, it's time for presents. For a couple of presents, there are some very institutional ones, and there are a couple that are more bizarre. So let's start with the institutional ones and our president.
never been given clothes before. <laughs> I did go to a woman's comics convention back, um, I guess, in the early part of the 21st century, and they gave me jewelry. But I've never been given clothing. Thank you so much. Oh, this is gorgeous. And Deirdre now, still in the institutional presence, more or less, we had this bag made in your honor. Of course, it's a Trina drawing, so you've got a couple of university things in it. And there are some for you as well. Uh, so you can get your own Trina Robbins bag. This is fabulous. This is fabulous. Oh, look at this. Trina is in today's paper. <laughs> you are. Things for wine, look. You, you do drink wine. Drink Perfect. Wine. <laughs> I don't know, it's a nice thing Ooh. with, uh, you know, very French, very posh. Oh my goodness. Look. But I don't know, okay, that's an opener. <laughs> that's an opener. That's a cork. Oh, of course. Yeah. What's this? That's to stop drops on the bottles. Oh my goodness. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> no, of <I'm> scars. <laughs> and now, well, we thought there were two things we could do. Uh, here in Bordeaux Montaigne University, we've got. Um, masters that are specialized in illustration. So they are students in uh, Julien Bézia's class who draw, they study drawing. And today we asked them if they wouldn't mind, uh, as you spoke, as we did the, the speeches, if they wouldn't mind uh, drawing some of the some things. And so they did to make a gift to you of these drawings. Oh, they're shy. They're not coming here. Why not? Ah, so it's getting prepared, but you will leave the room with a set of drawings made by our wonderful students here. Thank you so much. getting ready. Oh, maybe you hadn't planned to give them straight away. Yeah, it was okay. Oh, perfect. So you'll get a lot of them. There is still this... Let me take it off if you keep it. Merci. Isn't it great? We will take photos and we will put them on the side so that you can all see them. And last but not least, as we teach all our students this phrase, uh, maybe you heard that in my speech I mentioned that Trina was the Trina in uh, Johnny Mitchell's Ladies of the Canyon. And so, because there is a choir here at the university, we asked if they would be kind enough 
to prepare the song for you. And so we are going to listen to Ilona, Marilou and Leo, who's going to be at the guitar. And they are going to sing the song for you. tell you about that coat that was the second hand one. Um, in 1967, I discovered, in February 1967, I discovered that nobody buys anything in New York in February because they've spent all their money for Christmas and because the weather is so terrible and because they know that there'll be two more months of terrible weather, and so they don't even leave their house. So that year, that month, I supported myself fixing, altering vintage fur coats because it was very fashionable in 1967 to wear vintage fur coats. And I knew, I, I met the owner of a warehouse that sold them, and they would buy them from him, and then they would say, well, how can I shorten it? Or how can I remove the shoulder pads? And he would send them to me. So that was how I lived in February of 1967. Okay, so one woman brought in a beautiful skunk coat, long-haired, gorgeous, and she said, 
she left it with me. She said, I don't know what I want to do with it yet, so just hold it, and I'll come back and tell you. Well, she never came back. And so that I, had, I wore the fur coat. That was my coat that was a second-hand one. And it was huge shoulders, you know, from the 40s. And it was kind of three-quarter length. So I kind of looked like a die, you know, one of a piece of dice wearing this coat. <laughs> but it was very comfortable and very warm. So that's the story of the coat that was a second-hand one. Trina Robbins a écrit un petit mot dans le livre d'or de l'université. Euh, merci encore une fois à elle, merci à, à vous toutes et à vous tous. Euh, ce n'est pas totalement fini, nous vous proposons de partager euh, un verre dans le, dans le hall euh, en sortant de l'amphi. Vous pourrez en profiter également si ce n'est si pas déjà fait euh, pour regarder, pour euh, oui, jeter un œil à, à l'exposition. Euh, un œil ou deux à l'exposition euh, qui est faite de, voilà, de panneaux racontant un petit peu le parcours de, de Trina, une exposition créée par Jean-Paul Gabillet et avec l'aide de nos collègues du, du service commun euh, de documentation. Et vous verrez d'ailleurs dans des vitrines des, des ouvrages euh, de Trina euh, qui, sont, euh, qui font partie des collections voilà, qui, dont l'université peut s'enorgueillir. Merci à toutes et à tous.